and welcome to episode number 11 of the Knighted Ones podcast. We are the only podcast that features a former UCF national champion, which Trey, you're going to have to get your ring out here to show the audience at some point. A former UCF radio host and several podcasters shooting the breeze and talking UCF sports. If you notice this week, I have my collar popped because we got a dub. Uh, It's been a long time, five weeks of no collars being popped. I feel like an SMU alum right now, but that's okay. Uh, We won, so I'll take it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring the guys in. I I missed last week, but they did a great job in my absence, uh, and uh, they picked against UCF on my behalf, so I don't know. Maybe I'll let them start picking from now on because we won. Uh, Not really. So uh, first up, uh, we're going to bring... Alan to the stage. Welcome back, Alan. What's going on, Roger? Uh, Happy to be home. Happy to be back on the show. Thank you so much for hosting last week. I appreciate it. You did a great job. Uh, You figured out all the buttons and the banners and uh, still managed to uh, be coherent. So better than I usually do. Uh, Go go nice. Charge on. All right. Uh, And as always, let's bring back Trey Neal. Gentlemen, what's up? What's up? Hey, hey, it's a dub. It's a dub. Uh, much better vibes this week than than in weeks past. Um, by the way, I'm serious. You're going to have to break out the natty ring. Um, I do have a picture of my son with one on, um, but we need to we need to see the real deal there. I'm assuming you you actually went back and picked it up before you went to Nebraska, right? Oh, they gave it to us. Uh, it was that spring in the spring game. That year. Okay. All right. Okay. Just making sure, just making sure you have some bling to show. Absolutely. All right. So in honor of all of that in this dub and it being Cincinnati this week, the bear kittens, uh, as we like to call them, or at least I do. Um, I wore my natty champions shirt because I had nice. to get all the feels this week to enjoy this dub. Uh, and, uh, let's, let's get started. Um, and as always, we start with text talk. These are things that we talk about during the game uh, that are in our text. So, uh, Alan, why don't we start with you this week? Okay. Um, I had one uh, from Rob that was uh, UCF defensive MVP Emery Jones uh, because obviously <laughs> he uh, didn't have a good game and usually doesn't have a good game. And that's the... Uh, Second time we've beaten him here at UCF, uh, obviously when he was at Florida. And um, the other one was, did I just watch the best defensive series of the game for UCF? Um, And I followed up with maybe the season because there was a couple of series there where the defense actually uh, did look pretty good. So those are my two text talks. Yeah, we got pressure. Uh, And that was uh, that was uh, that was good. That D line. Uh, showed up and showed out the way that we expected them to. And, you know, as we get into the game, one of those questions we might want to ask, is that because this was a G5 line or a P5 line? So that'll, that'll, that's, I think, a question we kind of want to explore. All right, Trey, Neil, what did you have this week on your text talk? So my text talks, I had, um, Josh said, love that fake. Um, I think it was one that we ran the fake punt. I agree. I think that was a great call. Um, again, I never have a problem with the trick. Hold play. on, you're okay with a trick play? Well, <laughs> to, to, I, I think that one was planned out. Like the way they were waiting on a look for it. So, like to me, I like those kind of trick plays where you know it's planned out. You're waiting for a specific look to get, and that's when you call it. You know, so I think that was good. And then obviously, Allen at the end, losing streak over again. Nothing, nothing better than getting a win. Um, you know. We, we can nitpick and stuff about it when we get a li- little bit later. But, again, as long as we get the dub, man, there's not much to complain about. A dub is a dub, man. And uh, I will certainly take that over a five-game, yes, count them, five-game losing streak that hasn't happened at UCF for a very long time. And Absolutely. before we get into the game, I would be remiss not to mention uh, and send our thoughts uh, to Josh uh, and his family, unfortunately, He is out this week with a family emergency, and um, he wanted to be here, but obviously family always comes first. And so, you know, our thoughts with him and his family, and and we appreciate him, and we'll miss him this week. 
um, and hopefully we'll get him back soon. So, Josh, um, <laughs> pouring one out for you, not literally because it would end up on my desk. But uh, let's go ahead and, and get back to the good vibes and, and talk about the Week 10 Bear Kitten Scat. So, as you know, I'm trying to become – you know, do dad jokes in my in my titles here. I've got a really good one uh, for Texas Tech. So those of you that have followed Texas Tech at all or like GIFs, you'll understand it. So I'm, I'm kind of drum rolling it for next week. But this week, we're going to talk about the bear kittens. So, you know, one of the things I wanted to start off with, there's been a lot of uh, noise about this being the first Big 12 win and whether this really is or should be considered our first Big 12 win, considering it's against our former brethren in the American. Uh, it's a good thing because we had a little bit of a rivalry going with the Bear Kittens from Cincinnati. And with this win, we took the lead in the, uh, in the you know, the, the series. So that's super exciting. But I'd like to start with, what do you guys think about all those people that are saying this really doesn't count uh, or does it feel like it counts less because this wasn't part of the uh, LOA, uh, LO8 or leftover eight or hateful eight or acronym that you want to put in there um, for, uh, for the win? So Trey Neal, is this a true Big 12 win and should it be considered that? I mean, technically, yes, it is because it's conference play and we're in the. All right, let's stop conference. it there. He said technically, well, yes, because I know there's a but coming after that. What he started with, technically, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, but, but just, you know, realistically speaking, one, again, we're one of the newcomers. Um, so it's kind of a similar playing ground in a sense. Um, just from, again, like the leftover eight, hateful eight, whatever you want to call it, it wasn't one of those teams. Um, so it kind of has that feeling of, you know, what's the difference between us playing in the AAC and the Big 12 getting this win? Not really much. Um, but, you know, on the bright side, again, it is technically a Big 12 win. Um, but, I, but I wouldn't, you know, I wasn't really – of course I was happy to break the, you know, our snide. We were losing five straight. But I, I, I think we should beat the teams. I think we should be the best of the newcomers. We should be the best team, in my opinion. So, you know, it's a good win, but, you know. That, that's about it for me. Just it was a good win. I think, you know, once we get into the, the actual game, we can expand a little bit. But well, yeah. well, we other than BYU, we play the other two newcomers. Right. So uh, we'll at least have an opportunity to say we're the best yep. of three. So there'll be Houston, uh, Cincinnati. Obviously, we knock down. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still an opportunity to do that. And more importantly, there's a chance for us to go bowling still this year. This was a big, big exactly. game for that um, as to whether we had the chance to actually do that or not. I think a lot of people were questioning that uh, after last week's results. So, Alan, before we get into that, what do you think? Is this a true Big 12 win? Does this count or is this an asterisk, as I like to say all the time? In my mind, it is an asterisk. Um from a historical perspective or from a factual perspective, like, yes, it's a big 12 win, but from a, an emotional kind of like morally perspective, like I, I don't count it. I mean, we beat someone that we've already beat four times that was in the last conference with us. Um, you know, and when you talk about Houston and BYU, two of the newcomers already having a win over one of the leftover eight programs. Um, I don't want to be, you know, just us and Cincy being the only teams that don't beat a leftover eight program. So no, I feel like when we look back in history, when we remember what our first big 12 win to me, it's going to go more towards the first true big 12 team we beat. So in my mind, no, I, I don't count it. I mean, we beat a team we've played a bunch of times and we've beaten before it was, you know, you could tell it was more on equal footing playing against them. Um, so for me to, I really think to get, you know, that noise off of our back, is you got to beat one of the leftover eight teams. Um, I don't think the it's gonna it's gonna feel a lot different in my mind. The feeling of beating Cincinnati was just pure relief of ending the losing streak. It didn't feel like 
we achieved that major milestone of getting our first Big 12 win from my perspective and just the overall like vibe and feeling. Um, so if we can either beat Oklahoma State or Texas Tech, then I'll be like, we did it. We finally got our first Big 12 win. But until then, it just feels like we beat an AAC team. And, you know, five, six years down the road, if UCF and Cincy are killing it, you know, different story. But this year, look, we, we beat a two and seven team that, also doesn't have a doesn't have a Big Twelve win at all yet, so I, I think other than ending the losing streak, um, no, it does not feel like our first true Big Twelve win yet. So what if we don't beat Texas Tech or OSU? Then I guess we're waiting until next year. Yeah, wow. I mean, it's, it's gonna feel like you know, like it doesn't feel like we belong yet in a sense. Like I, it's almost just like you know, good job. You beat, you we beat, beat a two and seven team that you know is it's just, yeah, just as yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, it's listen, in our defense, normally Kansas is two and seven, and they've just had a wild hair up their butt the last two years uh, for us to join the league. I'll so, take any win against any of the big 12, like Baylor, for example. They're the worst uh, leftover eight team record wise. I would have I would have been extremely happy for to hold on and beat them. Yeah, uh, I mean, again, I think like our at the beginning of the year, realistically, if we would have been a middle of the pack big 12 team, a couple of, you know, beat the guys that are new and then beat a couple of the teams um, that were left over eight. I, I think, and I think we could have won a couple of those games anyway. I think that was really the goal. That was the expectation. It wasn't to be dominate the conference, you know, obviously wishful thinking, you know, that's what we wanted, but realistically it was kind of be in that middle team our first year. Um, so again, until we get that win, we're really, if, if we don't beat one of these leftover eight, we're going to be a bottom bottom half team and only beating the, you know, the guys that we just came with. So I think again, it's more so to feel like we belong in the conference, feel like we can be competitive in the conference. Yeah. So I'll say this, uh, we could definitely still be a middle of the pack big 12 team. Cause we're still a big 12 team as is everybody else. So no matter what happens uh, and that really counts for the out of conference too, we're still a big 12 team. Um, so for me, I guess, you know, I, I think there is a difference between feeling for us versus other people. And here's the reason why I say that. For UCF fans, we've spent ages uh, climbing the mountaintop, right? And we finally got here. And now that we're at the mountaintop, went into the season, you know, barring injuries and, and a, a few hundred uh football angered god moments where we're bouncing footballs off of people's feet uh defenders and doing all kinds of crazy things we would have already had that in baylor i mean we should have beaten baylor let's let's just be honest like i i, I it, it's unfathomable to me like I, I don't understand how that happened like literally don't understand how that happened um however that being said um, I think Alan has a valid point that it won't matter six years from now, but right now, um, we're looking for validation for that climb. This, this, this fan base has been looking for validation for a long time and we got to the P five. So that was partial validation that turned into the P four, which is even more validation because now you've eliminated an entire conference. Um, and I think that, you know, for us and our for our own fandom, fandom to validate ourselves, we need to get that P5 win. But it's a feeling. Um, but, I mean, like you're saying, I, I, I think just the way our trajectory has gone, even the last 10 years, I don't think us as UCF fans want to be a middle-of-the-pack P5 team. Like, the goal does not stop here. Like, we're in the – Nor P5 should we be. Yeah, nor like, should we be. Yeah, we like, have more skilled talent than what a lot of these P5 teams have. Yeah, exactly. What they have is depth that we don't. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's where, like, the the bar, we haven't reached where we want to reach as a program, in my opinion. Not what, at least from the goals that we set when I was playing or what we wanted to, the program to be. This is just another stepping stone. You know, I don't think we want to be a a Vandy or, you know, a Mississippi state, those, those kind of teams that are just in the power five and just sit here and collect the check. And you we're know, not going to be average. No, I, I know. Be, I, that, no, matter, 
no matter what any AD who's sitting does, whether it's Terry Mohajer or anybody else, the fan base and the program and the university will not allow us to be mediocre. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I, I think that's the thing. Like, I think that's where getting that actual conference win matters. Like not beating the newcomers. I think that's where finishing middle of the pack year one, because you can kind of bit like, it's something to build towards something to, to be proud of in a sense, like in my opinion, at least it's something to be proud of to say, We've won a couple of the Big 12 games or, you know, against these leftover teams. Um, and and we, we had a good first year because you can build on that um, as a threat, just as what we want to be in a program, which is, again, the top 10 program in the country. That's what Yeah, and I, I think, like, you make a good point. It's like – it's kind of like a, a pride thing. Like, you want yeah. to get um, that first true Big 12 and, and the belonging part. Um, for me, it, it, I'm not even – we're not even talking about the future yet. Yeah, of course, you chef should never settle for middle of the pack. We're just talking about right now and answering that one question that Roger asked is, does it feel like a true power five win? And it does. And, and when you are sorry, a, a true big 12 win. And, and when you compare it also to like other teams that have made this jump, for example, Utah and TCU, their first year in their new respective conferences, they went four and five in the conference and beat teams that were, you know, pre-existing. So, you know, they were middle of the pack and got four true wins. So, you know, I'm looking for recent comparisons. And you'd hope that, you know, when I looked at the beginning of this year, my, my goals were to be bowl eligible, to have the best record of the of the new four and then get at least two to three, you know, two or three wins against, you know, uh, leftover eight teams. So for me, it's been very disappointing to not have one of those yet. So Cincinnati, like I was already circling that as a win before the season started. So for me, it's like, okay, we just did what we already thought we were going to do. I want to get some wins against some big 12 teams. So yeah. I'll say all of those things are still in front of us. It's possible. Yeah. No, the, like you literally every single one of those things that you mentioned are still in front of us. Yeah. Right? No, I'm just saying it, it's possible. Right. I just don't know if it's going to happen, but it's definitely possible for sure. Yep. So I think bowl eligibility has a better shot, but we do have to beat, OSU or Texas Tech. Yeah. And uh, I think it's Texas Tech, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. All right. So getting away from questioning our own wins, <laughs> let's go ahead and transition to the actual game. So um, let's talk about it. Like like we we were finally able to close out a game, right? We we took the victory formation. We got we took the knee. Um, what what do you guys think about this team? I know from Gus's uh, press conference, uh, he talked a lot about, you know, they came out hand in hand, arms interlocked. Um, you know, and we've we've made a big stake in Trey you specifically about, you know, the need for this team to to be more on the sidelines, to be more of a team on the sidelines. And, you know, you you made the very astute uh, observation that, Hey, these guys are just sitting around unless the coach comes and, and yells at them or tries to motivate them. They're just sitting, you know, they're going and they're sitting down. And and you know, one of the things we talked about was uh John Rice's ability to uh motivate the team. And you know, a lot of comparisons are made to Mackenzie Milton, and that will always happen uh because he was so successful. Um, the difference between John Rice Promley and Mackenzie Milton is um you know, obviously from a town, there's a talent gap there. I mean, Mackenzie Milton is just Mackenzie Milton. That's, that's all there is. Um, JRP is not that guy. However, what JRP does well is he is, you know, statistically, and I hate to say statistically because it sounds like, you know, like what you were saying earlier when you were talking about it, but right. Uh, technically, you know, it sounds like one of those terms. He's statistically a very good quarterback. He's also been hobbled. And so when you go on a losing streak and your quarterback isn't able to physically or otherwise, uh, talent wise aside, make those, uh, you know, those plays um, because his physical attributes are taken away um, to, to, you know, lead to the win, it, it takes away from your ability to motivate, especially when folks are on the sidelines and, and nobody else is stepping up. 
So JRP had a, a disadvantage, not only physically, but also in his ability to lead because it just sounds like noise after a while. If the rest of the guys don't get up and, and, and join in, join in that uh, noise, right? They, if, if they're not joining in and trying to motivate the team. So Gus said, uh, you know, one of the things he said, and he called out the team, which Trey, you've talked about, we've talked about is it shouldn't take the coaches to stand up and go walk over to motivate the team. They need to be motivating each other and picking each other up. And that's why they came out ar arm in arm and they credited it for the win. Did you see a difference? Was that the reason why the fourth quarter win happened? I think part of it too is, is, you know, JRP scrambles. How much of that was JRP, you know, just saying, screw it. I'm not going to, you know, being the old JRP, I'm not going to, you know, be timid on my leg and I'm going to go and get and pick up these first downs that we need to keep this drive going. Um, I, I mean, realistically to me, I, I don't think, I think this is a game we should have won. I, I don't, I, I wasn't necessarily moved in a sense because uh, again, kind of going back to what we talked about the first time, this is, this is Cincinnati. We played Cincinnati the last what five, eight years. You know, like that's this isn't a team where, okay, let's lock arms and do it. Like this is what you guys are supposed to do. Like, and I, I, I the thing that I don't want to take away from it because again, I think they're taking the right step. Um, especially from what I saw, you know, previously. I think you know, locking arms and things like that. But it, but again, to me, that doesn't show what a team is. That never showed us, at least when I played. Us locking arms and things like that isn't what made us tight. That's not what made us brothers. It's not what made us um, close. You know, that's not what it was. It was everything from the summer. It was everything from the spring. It was doing the program. It was so hanging out with each other all the time outside. You know, it was it was so much more to that. Was it barbecues? Yeah, we used to barbecue out, man. We Oh, I know. There's a there's a joke. There's a joke in there because Mackenzie Milton, you know, he went to Hawaii and took a, an extended leave oh, yeah. uh, from the yeah. team. And then there was a, a certain someone who was a quarterback at the time who held the barbecue for the team. And then the yeah, but the I joke. mean, even 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 outside of that, I think we as a team we probably had three or four barbecues throughout the year. We we threw. I mean, of course, we threw parties. We threw Halloween parties every year. We threw you know spring break thing like. Just things outside of just football and talking ball. We hung out with each other almost every Thursday. We went bowling, like things like that. We went bowling. It was like a dollar to get in and bowl. All of us would go and do it. Things like that is what builds like the camaraderie. And the reason I was upset last week about it was because, again, guys aren't saying anything. The only person, again, like you mentioned, Roger, was JRP, but he's hobbled. And it's not even a problem that JRP is thinking. The problem was there's nobody else speaking. Looking back at all the great teams I played on, even like when I didn't play, like my freshman year, there were a lot of vocal leaders, but everybody was talking all the time. Some people are get our rah rah guys. Some people are just keep everybody calm. Like let's talk. Well, ball. you guys, you guys also had the leadership council. I'm not sure if this yeah, team we had did. that. We and that was a program to help oh, leaders. Because is that a have, freeze? That was a freeze. I had a freeze. Did I freeze? Yes, you Briefly. did, and now you're talking oh, slow, gosh. like you've been tipsy oh. or something. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, but uh, like we had programs to groom leaders. Like my junior and senior year, um, we had young guys in there to teach them to let them see, like, hey, this is what we talk about, what we're working. Because you have to keep the pro like the program doesn't end when the seniors leave. It shouldn't, at least. It should be continuing to develop, continuing to grow. Um, and and again, we had guys like Titus Davis, Jemias Pittman. Shaquem Griffin, obviously, who are rah-rah guys on defense. And offensively, it would be Wyatt. Um, it wasn't even really McKenzie as far as a rah-rah guy when he was young. Um, well, I think McKenzie – the problem for McKenzie, and, and I hate to say this this way, and I, and I don't want to make this too much about that team, um, but the problem for McKenzie was he lost the locker room after he cleaned out his locker. He had to earn his way back in mm -hmm. to be able to be that person. Uh, at least that's what some of the other guys had said. So, yeah, uh, I mean, to me, again, I, I don't know. What do you think? Did you, as, did you guys feel that? So we, we, there, I mean, there was a divide in the locker room because, again, it, it does suck when a guy 
misses all of that. Again, I just spoke to, you know, those summers and that spring going through the development. It does suck when a guy misses all that. But but again, me, me personally, listen, man, football is so like football is just football. If you have things you're dealing with off the field, whether it's family, whether it's with you, anything to me, I'm always, you know, take care of what you got to take care of. Um, some people don't see it that way, and that's completely fine. But, um, bro, he what? was dealing with getting booed off the field and being homesick. That's yeah, and, what and, that and, was. Again, and, and people don't understand Mackenzie Milton is from Hawaii, he was yeah. legitimately halfway across the globe for him, you know, like yep. that's that's I'm from Georgia and I was homesick, you know, I, I like I couldn't imagine being. What is it? Four hours to L.A. and another four or five hours to Hawaii. Like, that's crazy. And you don't see your parents ever, really. The and that's why her, why his mom moved out. Yeah, like it's so much. So, so again, I wasn't really hard on it. But, uh, again, McKenzie, the, the thing that was beautiful about him, like, he knew that he couldn't come in and just be a rah-rah guy. He was a guy that, listen, guys, I have to show you that I care. I have to show you that I work. And he did it to a T. He didn't come in trying to make bosses, trying to be a boss, do all these things, he earned our respect back. And, and that's what you have to do because everybody can't be a, a chief. You know, they always say we need more Indians, not enough chiefs. I wasn't even consider myself a raw rock guy. I was just the guy, hey, keep everybody sane, make sure we're talking about adjustments on the side. I mean, people used to tell me to shut up because I'd be talking all the time. Um, but, but, like, that was my role was to keep everybody engaged. There's no mental lapses. We need to be on point all the time. Um, and I just didn't see that enough, but – Back to the original question. I, I don't think it was – to me, this wasn't the game to be like, yeah, look at our team being that. But because they could have not done that, and I still think they beat Cincinnati. Cincinnati is not a good football team. You you act it's like not. Cincinnati is the red UConn or something. I don't know, man. I, I don't think they're a good football team. I, I Just me personally. I, I didn't think they were that well, great. Um, I mean, well, let's, let's ask that question because Cincinnati it was in a ton of one-score games. Yeah. Like a ton of them. They also lost a bunch of people and they were um, also running thin. Well, yeah, well yeah, yeah, but I mean, their coach, their quarterback, yeah. their, uh, a lot of their defensive players, and then number 10, inexplicably, whatever he did, uh, supposedly like punched one of our players and then mm-hmm. grazed the referee and got ejected. <laughs> like, yeah, I but, but I again, think- I think. I don't think they were going to be a great team. You know, I, like like Alan said, I think looking at the beginning of the season, we circled this game as a win with what we had coming back with the guys we had on our team. Um, so I, so I this, guess, win, this win in Trey Neal's mind is an asterisk. No, nah, it's not an asterisk, it, but it, it's just to the sense of, Doesn't you know, feel I, don't, I don't, yeah, it, it's just, a, it feels good, yeah, because we, we broke the snide. But again, I don't really take anything from it because, once we get into like, because again in the game, th- the same issues I saw week one, week three, week seven, this week I still saw them. But the reason we won is because Cincinnati's not good. Like, in and my opinion, we didn't I, turn the ball, and we didn't turn the ball over. Oh uh, yeah, but I mean, again, if you if you look at we we could not stop the run again to to save our life. Luckily, they couldn't either, and R.J. Harvey was going crazy, and then at the end of the game, so did J.R.P. Like. When you're playing bad teams, you can kind of get away from flaws that you have. That's kind of the saying, like, when everything – when you're winning, you know, you kind of ignore what the issues you really have. I think that's what Oklahoma's realizing, too. I think we kind of exposed the flaw to them because they've lost every game. They've lost both of these last two games to teams like that. Oklahoma won a lot of games uh, coming from behind. Yeah. Um, they are not as good yeah. as they think they are. Yep. But I think we also played up to Oklahoma. We did. But, but like, if you look at the two teams that when we're going to get into Oklahoma State, those teams run the crap out of the ball, man. And they can do it well. Kansas is very well, good. Well, here, here's the crazy thing. The Big 12 has always been known as an air raid, like, throw it all over the yard league. And we mm-hmm. come in a league and everybody's pounding the freaking rock. And it's like we said before the Oklahoma game, Oklahoma is a good matchup because our secondary is good and we've got D line. They can get pressure on them. Yep. And when, you know, they're trying to throw the ball and our secondary does its job, the D line can get there. The pro- yep. where we run in and, and even in this game without going into the detail too much, the same to your point about the same problems. What did we say 
uh, and I feel like a broken record, <laughs> is the edges, right? Yeah. You saw guys leaning towards the inside our ends. Traymond did it a few times. Selscar was constantly doing it. If they just maintain their assignment and maintain the edge, a lot of those runs that you're talking about would not have happened. Yeah. I mean, they just cheated inside, and then when they cheated inside, they got killed with the block. Yeah, I, uh, and I don't, I don't know if they're being taught that. Um, I, I, I have no idea. Some, if they're being taught that, then they're doing right. To me, it doesn't make any sense. I would always just with what our issues are, just funnel it. Um, but I mean, again. Back, back to the original. Well, the original you can't point. do that if the linebackers are offset to the left. If you watch the linebackers. Now, we've done some different things, and we'll talk about it in a little more detail. We've done some different things with the linebackers. They're shifting to one side, right? Mm -hmm. So whether we have two and then one coming down or, or dropping back in coverage uh, or, or you know, in a three-point stance or whatever, those linebackers are shifted and their responsibilities are shifted to either the left or the right. That means the other end has to maintain the edge because he's got no help. It's like having a corner that's in single high and the and the safety yep. you know goes to one side of the field. Mm -hmm. You got to be aware of what you're in and and understand how you have to block even if it looks like there's a run inside in between the tackles, you have to be aware enough that you know that you have to maintain that edge because you've got no help. Yeah. So um, but, but but like you so I, I guess we kind of went on a tangent. Yeah, um, I know. We're talking really, about but just realistically, I don't I don't think this would be the barometer. Sure, is it great that you know the guys they came out and then they were showing you know brothers in arms things like that? Of course, that's great because it's better than not doing it. Um, but again, it shouldn't take you nine weeks, in my opinion, to to show that you're together. It shouldn't take you. I mean, we I said it last week. You know, it, it all of this talking about we're going to see what we made up of. You know, this that, and the third. We already know what this team is, you know, realistically we do. Um, is, is it great we beat Cincinnati in a tough, close game? Sure. But since, again, that's why I said Cincinnati's not good. I don't think they really were that good. If we would have lost, like I said in the group chat, if we lose this game, I'm not watching any more of these games because there's no excuse for us to lose this game, in my opinion. So then you have Gerard Bar Baker after the game tweeting about paying people. Otherwise, we're uh, NIL is going to lose us players. So 100% agree with that. All right, Alan, sorry. You had to listen to us rant for a little while. What do you think? I mean, I think I agree with a lot of Trey, what Trey said. I don't, I don't think we played particularly well. I just think that Cincinnati is that bad. Like you could yeah. just see like – if we would have played this way against any of the other teams we faced this year in the big 12, I think we probably end up with a loss, probably a narrow loss, but we still would have lost. Like yep. Emory Jones is, was up. Yeah. He, was, he played for our defense essentially. Yeah. I mean, Emory Jones is not a good quarterback. They've benched him in like two of the past four games. Um, you know, what Cincinnati has going for it, which is, is our biggest weakness, is they're a great rushing team. They've been all year. They're top five in the country, and they had two 100-yard rushers against us. That's like their strength, but their their quarterback is extremely unreliable. Their defense isn't great. Um, they lost a lot of pieces from last year. So I don't. I think we were honestly like, did we make some strides in this game? Let me go positive first. Did we make some strides in this game? Yes. We only had three penalties for for 20 yards, so we we cleaned up there. Um, Defensive Two turnovers. Leader. We had zero turnovers. The defensive line played good. They got uh, nine tackles for loss and five sacks. I mean, they were all over the quarterback. But some of the is like what, what Trey said, like some of the things we saw in week one, week three, week five, same thing. The run defense got torched. You know, we had the offense stagnate at certain times. Um, I, I don't think like – like it's different. If we would have beat Cincinnati by like three, four touchdowns, it would have been a little more convincing. This was not yes. a convincing win for me. We won by two points against a really bad team that is winless in the conference and has, hasn't won a game since week two. So, like, I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, we made all these strides and we look so much better. It was not a convincing win for me. We, we needed to stop a two-point conversion just to get out of there alive. So, um, I, I don't – like, there are still plenty of moments through the game where I felt this is a repeat of the week before. This is a repeat of the week before. But – Yep. Look, uh, JRP got healthier, clearly had the most rushing yards he's had since he's returned from injury. So we had a little bit of that dynamic back and we held on and we, I guess, kind of overcame some of our fourth quarter issues. But 
the same time, like we played a really, really, I mean, this is going to end up being the, they're going to probably be the last place team in the conference. Yep. And so for me, um, I don't think we played particularly better. We just beat a, a, a worse team and we, we made some strides in some areas, but do we keep up those strides against Oklahoma number 15, Oklahoma state or against Texas tech? Because as we saw against like Oklahoma, where we're all jazzed up that we played well and, you know, almost beat them. Then the following week we had the same issues against West Virginia. So, um, you know, I, I'm obviously happy that we got the win. And, and it, I think that puts some life back in the locker room. And, and it's like Gus has said, it gets that winning feeling back. Guys are smiling again in the locker room. They have some confidence. They finally feel that like juice of winning again. But I don't think it was particularly because we had some great performance. All right. So I'm going to differ with both of you. Makes for good content. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> here's what I think the difference is this week. Statistically, we've been very good offensively. We've also been pretty terrible defensively. We've also won, lost a lot of close games this year, and we've had some really, really weird things happen um, to be able to lose those games. What I will say, and, and I'm going to reference the text uh, that I sent, the one text, because I was working, and trying to watch the game while on set, uh, which doesn't work very well for anybody who's done video production, um, I kind of snuck away uh, and was trying to watch the game. I said, this team has had too many, too much dumb things, because we're a clean show, happen. There is no killer instinct. Coaches lost their ability to motivate. I mean, the D coordinator has no answers. The problem has been the off. Uh, has not been the offense. I think, uh, but I think that JRP lost his ability to motivate due to their record. One word, apathy. Now, that's a pretty strong statement. And that's how I was feeling in the middle of the game during that time period, Alan, that you're referencing, uh, where the, the offense kept stagnating. We were leading, we were you know doing our thing, we were getting the ball back after the half, um, yada, yada, yada. And then JRP used his legs and willed his way to two first downs. That is, no matter what you think about JRP, that was the piece that was missing. And for once in five games, we didn't go to it and just lay down. He during last year's games and this year's games, you could say anything you want about JRP. Statistically, he's actually a pretty good quarterback. However, um, the thing that we were missing was that one person who was going to step up and make the big play. JRP had enough um, strength or, or, or Health. confidence in his legs to be able to make those two runs happen and then uh, also for that last first down that we needed to ice the game, right? That did not happen in our five losses. Because to your point, Trey, nobody else was stepping up and saying, hey, I'm going to make the play. Traymond Morris Brash leads the Big 12, not the AAC, not the four uh, new teams. He leads the Big 12 in sacks. We have the pieces. We've had the pieces. We've we offensively we've outgained our opponents. We just didn't have that spark when we needed it. George O'Leary and Gus Malzahn. What do you hear when you have close games like that? You lose, win, and lose games on one to two plays. There's going to be one to two plays that are pivotal in the game. What did Blake Bortles have the ability to do? He threw it to uh, against Temple when our backs were against the wall to um, JJ Wharton, Wharton, right? He had the ability to pull a rabbit out of a hat. Mackenzie Milton, how many close games did we play in 2017? Crap load. What did you, and what did you say, Trey? We never thought we were going to lose. Yeah. Right. And you did it. 
And I say you did it because you were a part of that team that went through all of that, those emotional roller coasters, right? That turned out you guys were, were not in an emotional roller coaster. The Hypo games. What was the biggest thing that Hypo was known for? Going bone, right? That's the biggest positive thing that he was known for was going bone, right? Yep. Those pivotal, pivotal moments those pivotal wow i can't say it pivotal plays right in games and there's usually one to two of them and it's proven week in and week out this team has been able to move the ball this team has been able to almost get off the field there's uh I, i've got to look at the i don't have the stats offhand but we've played more fourth downs defensively than we have in years this season Right now, why is that? Is because third and short, third and two, third and three, third and four, we haven't proven that we can stop the run if somebody really bangs their head against the wall and says that, right? Yep. However, if we get those third down conversions down, this defense is a lot better because they've made plays. They just haven't made it when it matters. And this game, we made it when it matters. So I will say... That the difference in that is all of that jargon on the sideline and the fact that you walk out arm in arm and maybe they start believing. Do I think it matters against OSU? We'll talk about that at the, at the preview, right? But do I think it matters for this team for the rest of the year? I 100% do. So I, mean, I love the positivity. I love it. I, I agree with everything you're saying, I, I but... Uh, maybe you're, you're, this wasn't towards your point, but I still don't think that means that the team played well. Like you might have had JRP, his his uh, ability to amp up a team and make those big plays. Of course, that was pivotal in the game, but that doesn't mean the team played necessarily well. I mean, we got outgained by over like 130 yards, and we put up one of our least offensive outputs yard wise all season. So I agree with everything you said, and I think it was all mattered. I just that doesn't that doesn't make me think that we played particularly well, though. We just made we made some strides in certain areas like the maybe the leadership or making those one to two plays that matter, which I get, you know, influence the win. But I don't think I looked at that. And game that's where we lost well. all season long. We played better in other games. But yeah, we I played just, better in other games. I guess yeah. I guess to also like Alan's point, like a, a, a Roger agreed, like pivotal moments earlier in the year is where we lost games. But we also lost those games because we weren't better than these other teams were playing. Like, I think it's a mixture of... You don't think we were? I think we were at least on par because we were able to win with, with the exception of Kansas. That's the only game that we got run out of the stadium. We outgained them. And, and so for me, for me personally, because we cannot stop the run, I always... In my opinion, if you can't stop the run, you don't beat anybody, in my opinion. Because if, if somebody, a smart person... If you don't want to stop the run, I'm just going to run the clock. I'm going to run through your face all game. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can adjust to it. At least when you pass, you can have a bad snap. You can The quarterback can make the wrong read. You can throw picks. When you can't stop the run, you don't want to be physical. Like That is a manhood kind of challenge. That's why I think, again, I've talked to guys. I don't think our team is physical enough. I don't think we play physical. I don't think we're hitting. Defensively, I agree with you. Yeah. We've talked about that ad nauseum on here. Yeah, and, and I think that's why I feel like, even though the score doesn't say it sometimes, like, of course, like, yeah, Baylor, I think, might be the only game we kind of blew, like, we, we blew that game. Oh, there was no, no there's no kind of, we, we, yeah. we, I mean, yeah. that was, that was. Yeah, it, it was, but, I, but my. Historic but my proportion. Point, yeah, but to my point, at, at even at the end of that game, all Baylor started doing was running the football, and we couldn't stop the run to get off the field to win the game either. And, and I think from well, that. Well, the offense we also. Game, the yeah, offense but I mean, also had some breakdowns because they had some crazy, silly yeah, things. They had some fumble sixes, of, but that's what I'm saying. Like the pivotal moment when we need to stop, we cannot stop the run. You're going to lose the game. Same thing in the next week, Kansas State. We're going back and forth, back and forth. When we needed to stop, Kansas State just kept running the ball. Offense, we we get stopped once, we're, we're, we're it's over because we know they're going to keep running. We can't stop. You go to the next week and the next week. Every single one of these weeks, 
if the team runs the football, we can't get a stop. Now, Oklahoma, like we said, matchups make fights. They wouldn't run the football, and which is why we kind of stayed in the game because they were wanting to pass so much, which plays into our strength. Um, and it came back to bite them against the other teams the next two weeks. And then I think we saw the next week with West Virginia, they just ran the ball again. Like, I think that's where, to me, even though, yes, it's one or two games, I think – I'm just going to speak for the defense. I think offensively we can, we're in these games. Defensively, we will not win games if we cannot stop the run, in my opinion, unless you, you go against a Cincinnati who is we're a, we're, we were a bad team record wise. So there were though, but, but that's kind of counterproductive or counterintuitive, right? Because you just said if we play teams that we can't stop the run, we didn't stop the run, and we played a top five rushing offense. Yeah, and we still won. So, what was the difference? The difference was we got off the we got off the field two or three times. Just I like think the opponent that. matters. Well, I think it's, like because they, they it's, a, it's because they're bad. Like it's because they are a bad team. Like that's what I think it is. Like I don't think because again, if you take this exact game we played and you put them against all the other teams, we don't win the game. The only time we are going to win, which this is why this was our first win, is because Cincinnati is that much worse. Like, I think if we if you simulate in a hypothetical world, offense stagnant, stagnating out, we still can't stop the run. If I were to tell you before the game, Roger, we're not going to stop Cincinnati in the run, and our offense is going to stall a lot throughout the game, you would not have thought we would have won because that's what we that's what's caused us to lose all this year, all year. That exact problem. But Cincinnati is just Again, they're not that good, in my opinion. Now, and I could be wrong. I just I mean, that's two and I, seven. I think the results kind of speak. For well, they're really. two and seven, but they're in the same situation that we are. Is every game that they've lost has been less than seven points. But but our so they're not is that so bad. Our well, our roster is a thousand times better than Cincinnati's roster. There's no Cincinnati that would start on our team. And we, should, and we should have run away with it, other than their defensive lineman, whoever that guy is. Yeah. I can't remember see, his name. That, that, that's yeah. a problem to me. Because if we're a thousand times more talented than the team, why do we only lose by – why do we only win by two points? Because the offense stalled. So so that's my point. The only, we can get away with beating our offense stalling and winning because Cincinnati is so much worse. When the talent is anywhere close – we're gonna lose the game because yeah, the opponent are matters, severely yeah. flawed. Like our flaws are severe. It's not like because every team has a flaw. I mean, you see it especially this year. They so have when do you give teams. credit to the team for actually stopping them though? Because they did stop them, despite it being the number five rushing offense in the country. You can't just gloss okay. over that. I, I mean, again, I, I guess we stopped them in. Th- I don't think we stopped what they do well. I think they stopped themselves in sense. Emory Jones is the reason they lost. We didn't – if they would have just oh, – he made some poor decisions. I mean, he was holding on the ball way too long. The RPOs – I don't even know why they got away from the run. Like, they oh, were really – there. Down our, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, it, it doesn't – it wasn't like, yes, of course we beat them. Yes, we – Did Satterfield out Gus Gus? Is that what you're saying? I mean, <laughs> I mean listen, he might have, but, but, but like, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's the point I'm getting at is – they beat themselves more than we went out there and beat them, especially with the talent gap, in my opinion. I, I don't think it was – because even at the – like the talent is so huge. Why does the game decide on a two-point conversion, in my opinion? Like why is it to that point? Why is it that we're hoping Emory Jones doesn't make the right read to win the game? Like that should not be the case. I mean, he Didn't he have someone wide open in the in the corner? Yeah, uh, yeah. he did. He did. And, well, and like, so did JRP a few times. Let me ask you a silly question. This goes back to what we asked at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the show when I was kind of like doing my little monologue thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, lines? Did we win this game because uh, this was a G five line and not a not a not a P five line? In my opinion, yeah. But because right. I, I think like when you mentioned that Trayvon Morris Brash has, he leaves the Big Twelve in sack. I don't know the exact says. I would love to see what games he has all these sacks versus, like, our five losses. I don't remember them being super impactful besides Oklahoma. But He's averaging he's averaging over one and a half sacks per game. 
So like he's he's been good and he's been sacking. He Oklahoma was one. He got uh K, um K State. He's been great. He got, he's been one of the bright spots on the team. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Like him and RJ Harvey. Yeah, and Malachi Lawrence and again Malachi this week. He's really good. Yeah, like and I, so I guess I just would I would like to see like I guess a breakdown on like when these snacks come because again like you can I I think he's a very good player but to me. Where are these sacks when we need them? Where are these TFLs when we really need them? Like that to me, that's what I. Well, you can't sack teams if they're running three hundred yards on you because they're ball, they're handing the ball off, and the quarterback doesn't have the ball in his hands. That's the thing no, that goes no, back I, to what I we agree. said about Oklahoma and matchups, right? The yeah, reason we played, oh, none of these teams have been passing the ball, and when they do pass the ball, it's within ten yards of the line of scrimmage. So they're getting the ball out before our defensive rush can make a difference. And that's because the coaches have done their homework and they know our linebackers are not up to par. I like Period. That. Yeah. And I, 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 but I think that goes to also to the line play. I think like, I think just our front seven is small in comparison to the most of the teams we've played against. Um, I, I think Ricky Barber and Lee Hunter, I think those are, they're, they're, those are monsters. I mean, those, those boys, like Lee Hunter, yes, yeah, hundred percent. Th- those are big boys. It doesn't matter what conference you put them in. Like they're they're big ball, big boys. Um, but but I, Tremont I don't know. is I speed rush. rush. What'd you say? I said Tremont is speed rush. Right? Yeah, he's, he's gonna. A, he's, he's, a speed he's not a the end. yeah mass rusher. He's not a. You run right at him, and he's gonna set the edge. And, and, and how many how many whiffs did Selascar have this year? Like I love Selascar. He yeah, earned. Hard. Right, but he overran. I don't know how many sacks this year. We would have had yeah. probably at least four or five more sacks, at least, yeah. had and he not yeah. overrun his ankles. Yeah, I mean, again, I think this the styles do make fights. I think because of our our severe issues in the run game, there's no point to not. In my opinion, there's no point until you show us to run. I've been saying it for five, six weeks now. Until they show us they can stop the run play physical which that's we we don't play physical enough in my opinion defensively um and that's just as a whole i don't think we're striking people i don't think when you see us tackle guys are getting knocked back i don't know if that's a size well i don't even blame that on the size because no it's the way that they're tackling we've talked about exactly yeah one of our hardest hitters kyle gibson he was 170 pounds and he probably hit harder than everybody on our team like it's not a it's one. It's a way they're tackling. They're they're just throwing their shoulders and going at their legs. And I just don't think they want to hit. I don't think they want to play physical football. And the offenses that we played all year, they do. And I think that's a problem. You can't play defense and not want to be physical. You can't play defense and not want to hit strike, hit like cause pain to people. You don't want to. You never want to hurt people. Um, I, I still question to- how you're a linebacker at a D one level. And I and I hate to say this this way. If you're at 170 pounds, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was 190 some pounds coming out of high school at five. You it's know, bad. It is so bad. The, the yeah. linebacker depth and recruiting they've had of the, I mean, like if Jason Johnson didn't stay this year, I don't even know what they would have done. Like they have, and they that's, and missed, that's missed, part, missed, missed but that's part of it too. Right. And, and I'll, I'll sw- swap over. So you can answer the question, but that's part of it too, is like the senior linebackers that we did have that we honed, are gone and they're playing for Florida State uh, and Ole Miss. So, all right, what are your thoughts on that on that line question? I yeah, I agree, Trey, and I, I just think that yeah, I, I think you saw it was more on par. Like it felt it felt so much more comfortable playing Cincinnati compared exactly. to playing like other teams this this year. Um, so yeah, I I don't look maybe regardless if we've been in another other games which which we have i i understand that the talent the starting level talent is probably pretty close to a lot of teams in the big 12 but the depth is not we've already all agreed and established that um and that's why i think we looked at cincinnati they ever earned a similar situation uh they don't have that depth especially on the lines the big uglies like so it felt like it was more on par and we still just escaped with a win so and yeah. our starters, like, like you said, our, our starting talent, I don't think there's – out of the 22 guys both sides, I don't think there's many guys on Cincinnati that would start on our team. Right. And and 
and then you have these, and there would be probably a lot of our starters that would start on other big 12 teams, not all of them, but you know, some of them. Um, But yeah, I just think that the the opponent matters here and maybe Cincinnati has been in a bunch of one score games and all this and that, but I don't know. I, I just think they're not good and they have such a bad quarterback that that is a factor too. And, but when you go directly talking about the lines, yeah, I think, a big reason was, um, you know, was the, what was the fact that, yeah, they have a G five line. Um, and, you know, so I guess their O line maybe played okay to allow 200 and something rushing yards or, or our linebackers are just really bad. One of the two, but. Well, um, no, I mean, they have a good old line. They have to, cause they've been doing it to everybody. It's not just us. They've been doing it too. Yeah. That's like their, that's been their strength. Right. I mean, like you said, top five rushing offense, that wasn't just, against preseason teams no, it was against, good teams. against UCF it was against the same teams that were playing in the P5 so yes their offensive line is good there's no way they can't yeah. be and be a top five rushing offense I just think yeah I just think we look better because of the opponent like I, I agree with Trey that we put up this performance against most other teams yeah maybe there are, are scenarios where a bounce a ball bounces our way and we escape with a win like in some of these close games but if I'm talking about like a bigger sample size, like that's why I like, like when you talk about like basketball or hockey, you have a seven game series. Yeah. Most of the time, the better team wins in a seven game series. Exactly. So if you play, you take this game and you play whomever, West Virginia or, or Oklahoma state seven times the exact same way we played. I, I don't think we win most of those games. So that that's my thoughts on it. And I think playing Cincinnati's poor depth and poor overall team definitely helped us in this one. All right. So best of the rest. That's what I heard. Okay. Um, can we build off of this win and get to bowl eligibility? I mean, yeah, of course. You can build off any win. Um, do do I think, you think we will? That's no. a better question. No, because the same issues that we pointed out week one, I saw them last week. We just happened to play a worse team. I, I, I don't – realistically, I don't see us stopping Oklahoma State because they have a great running rushing attack. Number one in the country, or the, yeah. the running back is the number one running back in the country. Yeah, and he's very good. So realistically, I don't think he's we win that. big. He's a big Huge. dude. I mean, it, yeah, that's and that's what we struggle with because nobody on our team wants to hit big players. You know, like that's a problem. Um, nor can well, the we question stop. is, can they? If you're if I mean, you're, yeah, 100, if you're 170, 180 pounds and you've got a six foot something, 220, 230 pound running back. You know There's, it's a mentality. It's a mentality. Bro. Yes, size plays a factor, but I promise if you're 5'10, you, 170, 180 pounds, you're if I'm a running back, I'm running through you. If I'm six foot something plus I'm, two, I'm, two twenty two. I'm, I'm telling you, Kyle Gibson is the, the the reason why I changed my thought process on that was because I played with Kyle Gibson. He was soaking wet hundred, he was probably five eleven, six foot, 175 pounds soaking wet. I from the four years we played. He has knocked out players who were 230, 240, 250. And in spring ball, he hit one of our tight ends, knocked him out cold. When we played Houston. Oh, who do you, who do you, hold on. Who do you, who do you knock out cold? You never told us that story. No, I can't. I, I'm not going to. Oh, gonna, no. Yes, you can. No, I'm, I'm yes, you not, can. Who do you KO? One of our no, guys. You can't say stuff has, like that. He has caught, like, and it's not like they're cheap shots either. He's looking you in the eye. The guy tries to run him over, and Kyle hits him. Face first. Kenneth Farrow, the running back from Houston, Kyle knocked him out cold. Cold. Fumbled the ball. We like, and we were getting blown out that game. Still knocked like it's a mentality when you want when you want to hit somebody, it is a mentality. TJ Mutcherson, another safety. Jerico Johnson, another safety. Clayton Gathers, all of these guys, it's that's where all of our mentality comes. Like when we play it, I'm like, you can't play if you're not gonna be fearless and want to hit people. So I, I don't see that with anybody on the defense. I don't see it from our linebackers. I don't really see it from our D line. They play nasty, and they're, they're they play. I see that from Lee Hunter. I yeah, well, he yeah, he he's a, he, he does play. He plays a physical brand. Well, also no, he's, he, huge he's mean. He's huge. Yeah, yeah, he he has. Well, it, it has nothing that nothing to do with that. 
Yeah, I don't know if you remember the one press. Well, Trey, you already told us you didn't watch press. Yeah, I don't really watch them. <laughs> that dude is the one dude I would on that team that I would not. Well, there's a few of them. Let's be honest. I'm not the same size as I used to be. But, uh, you know, right now, like if I was the same size that I was before, that's the one dude I would not want to meet in a dark alley. <laughs> like, and, legit. And, that, and, that's the th- and that's the thing. Like all the defenses that I played on. We had six, seven, eight, nine of those dudes on our team. It wasn't just one guy. It was a bunch of – because that's what defense is. Defense is about being nasty, being physical, wanting to hurt players. You don't want – not hurt. You want to cause pain to them, though. Oh, you when want to knock get, their heads off? Like, like yeah, the big, like, we talk do. about this all the time. Like, we, when we I play – we, we get a thrill from knocking people's oh, heads yeah. off. yeah, there's no better feeling than knocking we, somebody yeah. the, out. We don't, yeah. don't want to hurt you. You don't want to cause any long-term damage to you. But we do want to instill a fear of if you run at me, you're going to be hurting after you hit. And yeah, I'm going to exactly. get back up, and I'm going to do it again. And sometimes that's what it's about. I remember when we played Memphis in the conference championship game. Anthony Miller is a physical player. He likes to instill fear because it makes people play soft on him. We literally were hitting him anytime. If he came and cracked, hit him, put him in the ground. Because people, you don't like getting hit. Nobody likes getting hit, in my opinion. I quit playing offense because I didn't like getting hit. You know, I'd rather hit somebody than get hit. Um, and I don't. I just don't see that enough from our guys. It, it it's the form, but you can have poor form. I, I know plenty of people that have had poor form tackling because it's hard. But if you are playing fast and physical, it you can make up for that. If everybody on our team was playing fast and trying to hurt somebody, knock somebody's head off, the defense would look night and day different, especially in the run defense. But that's all it is. All right, Alan, can we build off this? I think we can. Um, like I said, I think what Gus said was so true that like – Will we? Enter- will we? That? Will we? I want to change yeah. that question. I want to change it to <laughs> will we. I, I think it's largely dependent on oh, this Oh, he's, right. he's straddling the fence. Well, I, I, he's I, I straddling the fence. If, if you win this game this weekend, it's a season-changing win. I think the confidence permeates into the rest of the final two games and they could get it. I think when you, when you have a loss this upcoming weekend – the pressure of having to win out the final two games to get a bowl eligible. I don't, I'm not sure this team can handle that pressure. Um, but I, uh, will we build off this win? Um, I'm going to say yes, because I, 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 that doesn't mean I'm saying there's going to be more wins, but I think you can still build something off of it, whether it's confidence, some better habits, some key takeaways. I don't know the trick plays, some of the, decision making jrp's confidence back in his legs and the team seeing that and knowing they can ba- he can bail them out on third downs and on third and shorts so i think yes there are things we will build off it but i'm not saying that necessarily translates to to dubs for the rest of the season all right i'm going to say this this is going to be my hot take we used to have hot takes of the week we will be bowl eligible texas tech is not a good team they are on their third string quarterback they have lost against BYU. Um, what about Oklahoma State? You just skip over Oklahoma State. Yes. I'm talking about how we're going to be bowl eligible. I, I think we beat Texas Tech. And Houston. And they just they just uh, barely won against TCU. TCU is not good this year. Uh, and they have their own issues. I mean, they're, they, they should be good, but they're not because of injury. Okay. So Texas Tech, um, I think we win that game. I think we win, win Houston. So I think we get bowl eligible. I do think we use this as a springboard to to win those. I don't think we win those games had we lost this game. I think right. um, I think JRP is getting healthier. I think that um, you know we if we're six games in the hole and then seven games by the time we play OSU, there's no way that that team is not demoralized enough that they win that game against Texas Tech. So I'm going to say our first real Big 12 win, which should have been Baylor, is going to be Texas Tech. And I and we're going to uh, make sure that we knock the visor um, and the remaining hair off of Houston. So you heard it or you heard it here first. That's my prediction. All right. I think that's crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, that's uh, let's let's talk about um, 
you know, we kind of talked about JRP already. Let's talk about RJ yeah. Harvey. We haven't really said anything about him. And career high, 164 yards, three TDs, big 12 player of the week. Um, he just looked dominant. Um, I've, I've watched RJ Harvey a long time. If he isn't fumbling, that man is just dominant. That's his biggest problem has been he's had fumbleitis during certain games. But the thing that I've noticed about him this year is um, he reminds me of Greg McRae with his patience. He's yeah. waiting. Um, before, the, the biggest reason Greg McRae was as good of a running back as he was, and I think he was our last 1,000-yard rusher, if I don't if I remember he correctly. Yep. The reason why Greg McRae was so successful is he would hide himself in the line, pick a hole um, behind the alignment, and then explode. I'm seeing the same thing from R.J. Harvey. Um, you know, he, I, I feel like in the past, he would hit a hole, run, and then that was it. And he would use his power to explode through. The difference between uh, R.J. Harvey this year is that, and um, he's catching the ball off the perimeter uh, and making it happen that way as well. You have to account for R.J. Harvey, and um, and he proved it this week. Thoughts on R.J. Harvey? Yeah, I mean, I, I've again. I Would you want to face five nine, two hundred and ten pounds? Oh yeah, that's. That's not the that's not an issue though. Oh, there goes Trey. <laughs> no, I mean, sir, I mean, when I was playing, I was six. I was I'm six one and a half. I was two ten, two fifteen. Yeah, that's right. You and, were a bigger. Yeah, safety. I wasn't. You were. Yeah, a, you were a bigger safety. Yeah, I wasn't. Just a little safety. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I I think the kid is great. Um, as far as you know, I think he has an NFL upside. Um, like that's the kind of I I personally don't think he's coming back next year. Um. I think this is it. I think he's a redshirt junior. Senior. I'm not mistaken. Oh, he's a senior? Yeah. yeah. Oh, then, yeah, he's definitely leaving. Um, But, yeah, I, I think he has a NFL future. Of course, yeah, he's going to have to figure out the fumble issue, which that could hold him back a little bit. But as far as the skill set, the tools, what it takes to be a, you know, a professional player, I think he has all of it. I think he's big enough, plenty big enough. He's, what, 200, 210 is what you said, Roger? Yeah, and he looks and he looks good. Like he doesn't look small. He, oh, that he dude is stacked. That yeah, dude is he, like built. You know, yeah, and and he he has great burst. You know, he has the patience. A lot of guys don't have that patience. Um, he can catch, which that that's what the game is turning into. You know, so I think again, I think that he he showed it this past week, and I think he's shown it pretty much all year throughout most of the games. He is a he can play physical if he needs to. He can bang it inside the tackles. He can play out. He can run stretches. He can run pitches. He's shown a little bit of wildcat, um, and he can catch the ball. You know, I think, I think when we're gonna appreciate him more when he leaves, because I think throughout, at least when I played, a lot of these guys we had were more so specialists. You know, Adrian Killens was the home run hitter. Otis was kind of that dual threat. You know, he could run. He could well, we catch. have we have one right now, Johnny Richardson. Yeah, yeah, and and like, but RJ has all of it put into one guy which, which that's what makes those kind of guys special like a kevin smith um like the latavius murray's even you know will stand back those guys could do all of it in one body versus a, a specialty role so I, I think once we you know we get to next year and we start seeing some of these younger guys are going to be like you know they're good but they might be lacking in this area or they, they might be lacking in an area where rj could do it all we, we've asked him to do everything in the run game especially when jrp got hurt um we asked him to kind of carry our run game, and he's 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 pro- proven that he can. So, yeah, Latavius Murray, I saw him play this weekend in the NFL. He's still trucking along. <laughs> that, that, like, that train is that like train line, line, man. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's what? He's 30, 33, 34. I mean, and he's yeah, he's up he's for running like, back good. on average. What do they last? I think it's two and a half years. Yeah, is the statistic. So he's, he's double digits, I think now. So hey, man. And just awesome. a great dude. Um, yeah. All right, Alan, what are your thoughts on that? RJ Harvey. Yeah, he's been dynamic. Um, you know, it's interesting. We we talk about one of the things we talked about at the beginning of the season was we have all this running back depth. It was our strongest position on offense. We have five guys that are awesome. But what's really happened, and maybe some of it is some of those guys towards the end of the depth chart aren't as good as we thought. But I think it's more that RJ Harvey has taken this role and ran away with it. I mean, he has 
double the amount of carries as the next closest player, which is uh, Johnny Richardson. Um, and he's looked great doing it. I mean, it's four straight 100 yard games. The first player to do that since Latavius Murray in 2012, I think it was. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, he's going to be our first 1000 yard rusher here since Greg McRae, like you alluded to, Roger. Um, he's about 120 yards away. So uh, he should be able to do that in one or two games. Um, but yeah, he's, he's been fantastic. He's been one of the few bright spots of this season. I mean, pretty much he's been a consistent guy and that's what we need is some consistency. And he's, he's been there to do that when we needed a big play, whether it's a home run play or just that kind of short yardage using that big body, that big frame of his to get it. He's been able to do it. He's been able to catch, like you said, Trey. Um, I mean, he's an athlete. I mean, he used to be a quarterback in high school and was yeah. recruited as a quarterback to Virginia before transferring to UCF. So, I mean, yeah, he's been fantastic. I mean, fact that he's changed roles to a running back um i mean really since he got here they've been talking him up and, and then he unfortunately like he was listed as rb1 like two years ago but then he tore his acl and had to miss the whole year so he's been really dynamic i mean we started to see that last year in the cincy game when he had that yeah. game touchdown and um yeah he's been absolutely fantastic this year and yeah, i don't know about the nfl upside but uh but i don't really have the eye for that but um, as far as what he's done at UCF, he's been amazing this year and he's really started to heat up in the last four weeks. And, um, you know, a big reason why we've been in games, a big reason why our offense has been able to gain yards has been because of him. So, um, yeah, I'm thrilled with him. And I think, yeah, we'll probably appreciate him a little bit more when he leaves. And, you know, he'll probably go down somewhere, maybe in the top 10 for running backs all time. I don't know. Maybe he could sneak into that top five, depending I finishes out, but he's up there. He's somewhere up there and, and, uh, the UCF pantheon of running backs. Yeah, so I, I think he's also benefited from the fact that JRP uh, has uh, Not been injured. Much. He's been injured. So yeah. uh, we've yeah. leaned on him last last year. I think he could have had a similar type of season, uh, but he didn't because JRP is JRP. And what he does well is run the ball, and he gives us an extra dynamic. So um, I do think that Johnny Richardson has – suffered because of that because instead of three uh people that you have to worry about you really only have two so um all right let's let's go ahead and shift gears now and talk about mullet mania uh we're going to talk about the <laughs> mullet mania preview uh, as uh, many of you know uh, the head coach for the oklahoma state uh cowboys who i think has been the head coach 12 or 13 years so most uh, longest tenured coach in the Big 12. Um, is it 18 years? I think it's, yeah, it's been since like 2005 or something like that. Yeah. Well, uh, I will tell you this. He uh, has won a lot of games and he wins a lot of games because he's a smart coach. He's uh, very outspoken. I'm actually a fan of his because he tells it like it is. He, he reminds me a little bit of um, Mike... Um, Oh, who was the guy from Texas Tech that went to Mississippi Old... State? Yeah. Mike, um, the guy that, oh, Mike Leach. Mike, Mike Leach. Leach. Reminds me of Mike Leach quite a bit. You know, I mean, he isn't quite pirate level, um, but uh, he he tells it like it is and he and he says what's on his mind. And I appreciate that about him. So, um, you know, he he is he has the flowing mane. Uh, so you might underestimate him, but he's, he's actually done really, really well for Oklahoma state, um, and has managed to keep this team together. If you guys remember earlier on in the season, we were talking about, Hey, would they even have a team? Uh, because a lot of the team members were getting ready to portal up and, uh, and leave, uh, because he made a statement about the NIL, right. And it's not like Oklahoma state doesn't have money. They they've had T Boone Pickens. Uh, and oil money for a very long time. So they're, they're a well-funded program, irrespective of what they were earning. And, um, you know, uh, as we've, we've talked about, they are the number 15 team in the country. And somehow uh, we are only two and a half point dogs at home, um, which, is, which is interesting. I mean, we've been favored in, all, in just about every game that we've played this year, all home or away. And, um, you know, it's going to be tough to play uh, at UCF at the bounce house. I expect this game to be well attended. Um, we, we put in new lights on the, um, I saw that. On the ground level and in, in, the, uh, 
like over the exits where you actually come out of the tunnel and into your seats. So I think our, our plan is to blind them and maybe put them into epileptic seizures because it will be a night game. Um, but, uh, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, we're two and a half point dogs at home. And there that means Vegas is really seeing, and, and some of them had it down to one. Um, you know, we the home team always gets three points. So really we're talking about less than a touchdown favorites against UCF in spite of all of the success that they've had. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting to see, see that happen. I will say they had quarterback controversy at the beginning of the season. So, uh, they were trying to figure it out. It seems like they've hit their stride there. Um, and they're currently seven and two and five and one in conference and second place overall. Um, so good team coming in. Obviously we've beat it over the head. They're the number one rushing team. We've struggled with that. They've got a very big back uh in ollie gordon who um you know is the number one rushing uh running back uh in the country right now he's a he's he's massive he's a massive human being for a running back and he's good at what he does when he gets a full head of steam going uh he's one of those running backs that you might be able to stop him the first two quarters, I've watched a few Oklahoma State games and people have been able to slow him down or stop him early on, but he just keeps coming. And by the third or fourth quarter, he just wears your defense out. So um, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting game. Um, and the, the big question is, is can the run defense handle Ollie Gordon? Uh, so let me ask that question to you first, Alan. What do you think? Because I think I know what Trey's going to say. I mean, no, I mean, look, he's the number one running back in the country for the reason is for a reason, you know, he has over 1200 yards and 12 touchdowns. He's averaging seven yards a carry. I mean, we just allowed since we've, we've allowed eight running backs to put up a hundred uh, yards or more this year, eight different running backs in nine games. Um, so how well I don't think a miracle is going to happen. We're going to stop the number one running back in the country, uh, at least statistically. Um, from you know, you know that's what they do best. I mean, it's kind of eerie how similar a lot of these Big Twelve teams are. With you know, a lot of them have like great running games uh, at least this year, uh, but their quarterbacks like aren't that good. I mean, same thing with Alan Bowman, Oklahoma State's quarterback. He hasn't been great this year. Um, they've relied heavily on Gordon and. Uh, no, I don't see any reason why we could stop. That doesn't mean we can't win the game necessarily, but I don't see how we're going to stop a guy that is double the size of any of our linebackers and has been, forget UCF, I mean, he's been dominating a bunch of teams throughout the Big 12, so it's not really even necessarily a knock on UCF. It's like, you know, not a lot of teams have been able to stop him. I mean, he put up 271 yards against Cincinnati put up 282 yards against West Virginia. So, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I think we're going to have a lot of trouble, uh, stopping. How many yards did we put up against, uh, West Virginia rushing as a team? Um, well, I'm talking about just, just himself. He put up two. No, I, I get it's yards. just him, but we don't play just one running back. We, we don't do that. Like that's not how we do it. So rushing, how many yards did we put up against West Virginia? Do you remember? Um, yeah, I'll tell you right now. We put up 200, I'm sorry, 189 against West Virginia. Okay. So, and I think that was the number one rushing defense in the Big 12, isn't it not? Maybe. I'm pretty sure they are. And he so, ran what? 286 yards against them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I that was the point I was trying to make. <laughs> so, well, that answers your question. Do we have a chance again against him? Probably not. <laughs> All right, Trey Neal, what are your thoughts? Oh, wait, I already know what your thoughts. No, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> uh, again, I mean, if we can't stop the run, I feel like I've said this every week. If we don't stop the run, we're, we can't win. Because I, I just think if you can run the football with physicality, you can win. 99% of your games. Now, we honestly I, – I take back what I said. We could win. It's just we're going to have to play flawless on offense. I, I don't think we're going to be able to stop the run on defense. So, I mean, again, if you can run for 289 yards against the number one rush defense in the conference, I mean, 
put one plus one equals two, you know what's going to happen against a, a bottom. <laughs> well, we, well, we know what their game plan is going to be, right? So yeah. the question is, is is there a path to win this game? There, There's always a path in college. In, in sports period, there's always a path to win. It's just the the odds of it happening are, are very slim. Now, again, if, if we play ball control-ish on offense, um, play efficient, can't really stall out, and, and we do the same thing that they're going to try to do to us, then I think it's going to ultimately be who has the ball last or who has the more time of the possession. Or, um, who, has, or who has turnovers. Yeah, I mean, if we turn the ball over and they don't, then we're probably going to lose. Um, but I think there is a path for us to win. I just don't know how likely or how – yeah, how likely we're going to actually fulfill that. Okay. Fair answer. Uh, mullet mania for me. Um, we're starting to see defensive changes from Addison Williams, which is a good thing. We finally figured out that we can do different things. We can, you know, we've, we've seen it over the last two weeks. We've seen the linebackers shift. Uh, we've seen different defensive fronts. Um, we're we're bringing blitzers in. I, I don't know if safety blitzes are the right move, but then again, uh, as opposed to corner blitzes, but we have seen some safety blitzes come in. Um, I think our our biggest thing, and again, I'm going to repeat myself. You know these guys are not going to pass the ball. Stack the box. Get numbers on it. Uh, that way you can plug the gaps because even if the first guy doesn't get them, you're slowing them down enough that you can get help defense. And that's, that's the biggest thing. Now this last game and in previous games, one of the things that I've seen is just tackles that are so blatantly bad that you don't really slow down, uh, the defender or the offensive player long enough for your help defense to come in. So, you know, for me, you know, that's, that's really going to be something that we're going to we're going to have to look out for. And we'll talk about that in our keys to the game. All right. Uh, one last question before we move it, move on to Trey yelling at clouds, um, because we do have to talk to talk about basketball this week. And we're at 121 already. Uh, so uh, do do you and you know what? I'm not even going to ask this question. We did lose DJ Allen this week. Um, we've already kind of answered it. I, I do think. Um, our players are, are, are recruits. recruits are looking at this as an opportunity more than anything else. And by the way, shout out to EJ Colson. The man is watching our basketball games and, and tweeting them out. So, you know, no matter what you feel, whoever the right answer is for QB in the future, uh, EJ Colson has been recruiting for us. He's, he's all in on UCF and, and I appreciate that about that, no matter how his career turns out. Um, I respect that man for, uh, for being as all in as he is on UCF in spite of everything that's happened. So, which he's having a pretty good season in high school, uh, in his own right. All right. So let's, um, let's move on. We're going to talk a little bit about basketball hoops is officially started. We played FIU, uh, in our first game. Um, the guys uh, don't have as much to say about who we're actually going to have a guest uh, come in and, and talk. I'm, I think we're going to probably talk with him next week. Uh, Alan's trying to get me to watch uh, highlights while I'm on the show. Can't do that. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about hoops. So some things that, that they were surprisingly good. And, I, and I'll say that, you know, we didn't know much about this team. We had a bunch of transfer players that came in. Uh, we learned this week that we lost CJ Walker. Um, he, from what I'm hearing, has a meniscus issue. Um, so he may be back in December. He may not. Who knows? Um, but the last uh, scrimmage before the season began, he, uh, he has an issue with his meniscus and as a result released a video. And you know it's never good when UCF – actually releases a video saying, Hey, I'm sorry. I won't be there. I really wanted to be, I love you guys. Um, so hopefully we do get CJ Walker back, but, um, you know, this team was playing FIU who is better. They're still, I think 
seventh or eighth in their conference, picked seventh or eighth in their conference. They did completely revamp their team. They held their leading scorer from last year to two points, which is ridiculous. Um, and uh, they played really, really well. And and the biggest thing for me was uh, whenever you put new teams together, and we've seen this year in and year out at UCF, the chemistry and the ball movement is typically terrible for the first, I don't know, six, seven, eight, ten games, right? And this team did not lose, did not look like they lost a step when it came to chemistry, anticipation, and all of those fun things. Um, FIU did uh, get a bunch of bigs in, so they had the opportunity uh, athletically to be able to, um, you know, compete with us on the boards, etc. And UCF did a a really good job. Uh, Sellers and Allen were amazing. Uh, 30 point game for Sellers. He's a transfer um, as well um, that came in. Uh, for, I believe it was Ball State that he came from and uh, played absolutely amazing basketball. He did it on all three levels of the court. He, he had three point shots, um, he drove the basket, um, you know, he dunked. Um, you know, he, he just was really a really, really good player. And Allen, not our Allen, unfortunately, um, was uh, was also played really, really well, uh, distributed the ball well, um, and, and just, you know, I was very impressed. We played fundamental basketball, which is something that we've been missing at UCF for a very long time. So I don't know if that's Johnny Dawkins actually being able to teach his fundamentals or not defensively we played really well we saw a couple of the freshmen uh we played 11 players uh this this game so we saw a lot of a lot of new fresh faces uh they played really well Silla still in my opinion i know some people said he made some strides to me he's making the same mistakes as he did before um in fouling and shooting a three ball i mean i mean he made it like his first one but then he just spots up there he's not a shooting guard he needs to figure that out um ibrahim uh was really really good blocking uh we had a lot of blocks uh this game i'm a little worried about uh rebounding i didn't uh, we had a lot of guards now we had a lot of guards following shots and going in and getting rebounds but we can't do that against big 12 teams who have uh better talent so we're going to need to uh be careful of that Another thing, 21 fouls this game, most of it in the second half. Um, we need to clean that up. I think our guys got lazy. We were lead, leading at 30 points, uh, by 30 points at some point, which is still freaking amazing for a UCF basketball offense. We did have 18 turnovers. However, we did have 16 assists, which tells me that um, you know we're distributing the ball well, and that was awesome. Uh, we did have some problems with the the press at times, but overall, guys, I came away extremely impressed. We won 85 to 62 uh, at home. The student section was full. So shout out to the student section for game one in the middle of the week and being completely full. That's exactly um, what we want to see. Omar Payne played 15 minutes. He's He's a big transfer that we're expecting a lot of. He fouled out. Um, he had, a uh, six rebounds. So he's, he, he's part of our starting five, our new look starting five. The other thing is Darius Johnson. So Darius Johnson has been in, in games past has been pressing a lot because he felt like he needed to carry the team and, uh, he looked a lot more relaxed. We can play a four guard lineup, um, and still be successful. His three point his rainbow shot that he changed to last year, um, looked a lot better. Uh, this game. So if he can make that, if he can get up to, I'll, I'll borrow from Mike O'Donnell during the show, if he can get to 35% on that new look three point shot, um, he's going to have uh, a great season for us. And he doesn't have to be the creator for everything. And we aren't reliant that if he gets in foul trouble, um, we basically lose our offense, it's kind of like a depth thing um, as it is for football. So, um, Sellers, eight for 15. Um, he had 23 points. Um, Allen was three for seven, had eight points, but he facilitated a lot. 
He had five assists, uh, five rebounds, which is kind of crazy. Ferris Johnson, five for 12, 15 points. Um, DeMar Langford, uh, he was two for four. He had, uh, Johnny has a lot of expectations for him. The only issue I have with him is it, he's probably got the worst free throw shooting form that I've seen since Shaq. Um, so, I, I mean, that's really bad. Um, uh, Diallo was really, 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 really good. Um, he was great. The paint had three blocks in limited minutes. He had 11 minutes and had three blocks. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, so I'm expecting a lot from him. Uh, so overall, Taylor Hendricks or Tyler Hendricks played really, really well. 14 minutes, three for four for him, shooting seven uh, points. Very efficient. He played a lot better than what I was expecting. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll have a much tougher test. We play Miami next. Uh, they're number 13 right now. Uh, we play them on Friday. But uh, overall, I was pleasantly surprised by this UCF basketball team when we get a uh, chance in here to talk about uh, what he saw from a basketball perspective. It's like having Trey uh, come in here and talk about basketball. I'm super excited to see that as well. So all of that being said, I realize uh, I didn't change this. So I'm just going to put this on here for like two seconds. And Trey... It's time for you to yell at a cloud. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really have much to yell about this week. Um, what? I, I'm, I'm gonna yell, yell at you for not having anything to yell about. I've been yelling about the same stuff for not, not, not <laughs> six weeks now. I, I wish the defense would tackle. I wish they'd play physical. Um, I mean, other than that, that's not. It's it's the same story. You know, I feel like I'm I'm just I, I feel like now I am yelling at the clouds how much I repeat it. Uh, but but until we do that, you know, we're, we're going to struggle. I, I think we need to bring a, a physical brand of football back to the defensive side. We don't have to be I'm not saying play perfect defense. I don't think any defense can play perfect nowadays with all the rules and things like that. But there is a way to play physical, um, play violent, you know, I, not, not again, not to hurt anybody or cause them long term pain, but you play defense to play violent, play fast. And physical. listen, if you were playing defense and you don't enjoy like knocking somebody the F out, you're not a, defender. a clean show, you're not a defender. Because I can tell you that was the best part. And I've told you guys this, I've told Trey this, I've told Alan this the best part of playing defense is laying somebody out. Yeah. And, and I, even the guys that I played with, all of our corners. Even our corners would like to hit. Like Mike Hughes loved to hit. Navelle Clark loved to hit. They they love being in situations where they could get in the run game when they had the opportunity because it's fun. That's the whole point of playing defense is to hit somebody. You don't get hit. Like that's that's the one advantage you have on defense is that nobody's really trying to hit you. They're just trying to get the ball and be fancy and pretty and score. You are out there to hit people. Like so, I think. Until we do that, we're going to – I think we're going to struggle. You know, I, that's just me personally because I think defense is about playing physical and, and doing that. Um, last year, I, I thought we were a – we were a lot more physical than we were this year. Our problem was just getting turnovers. But I would much rather have last year's defense that played somewhat kind of physical a football brand, a brand of football, and just struggle getting turnovers than – what I see now. Yeah, the turnovers are great. We had one of the best red zone defenses in all of college football last year. Yeah, yeah. And again, like I, I would much rather have that than what we do this year because, uh, again, it's so demoralizing to me when you can't stop the run. Um, And it's even more demoralizing when it looks like you don't want to stop the run. You know, like that that's the worst part about it. So that, that's my yelling at cloud segment. I, I want a physical brand of – of defensive football back. Cause I, I've talked to guys about it, you know, that played in the past. That was one thing we were never going to let people do was, you know, punk us. And, and it feels like these guys don't care if they get punked on the field. Wow. That, that's, that's strong words. So challenge, yeah. challenge laid out there. I mean, you saw, you saw a bunch of uh, former UCF defensive players uh, saying something similar. They've been, I've never seen them so vocal as I have uh, this season. Uh, to be honest, it's it's because 
we know mistakes are going to be made. That's a part of it. We know you're going to play good competition. The one thing you can control on defense is how hard you play, how physical you play, because there's no boundaries to that. They, the only thing they can say is, hey, don't hit them that hard. Like, it, like, that's the only thing they can do is pull you back. We should never have a defense to where we're like, please hit somebody. Go be physical with them. We need to have a defense where like, hey, man, you can't be trying to knock people's heads off going for their, their helmet, lower, like doing that. But I would much rather have issues, those issues, than the ones we currently have. So right. that's what most of the guys are complaining about. It's it's a lack of physicality. It's a lack of dog. It's a lack of, you know, wanting to, to be nasty. That's what it is. And not nasty in the, like I say, the words. No, let's nasty. let's be real. No, st- yeah, stop. Yeah. I okay. want my defense to be nasty. Yes. I want them to have a chip on their shoulder. I want them to be knocking people's heads yes. off. I want them to have like that seated. mentality yeah. that I'm going yes. to. You got the ball. I, I'm coming to get you. Yes, you, they need to teeter on the line of playing dirty. Now, you, I don't want them playing dirty, but that you line is very Memphis or BYU. Yeah, you don't you don't want to play dirty, but you need to play as close to that as possible because before besides playing dirty, it's just playing nasty, playing physical, playing violent. That's all it is. Like that's that's. The next line past that is just playing dirty, which nobody wants to do that. So if you can play as close to dirty, that's what defense is for. Those are the best defenses to me in the country. You look at the Georgias. You look at the Alabamas. Yeah, they're good. They're athletic, but they are all physical at every level. They're physical up front. They're physical linebackers. Their corners are physical. Like that's how you play defense because that's that's what defense is for. So if you don't want to be physical, to me, you shouldn't be playing defense. You can go – Play offense, play kick return, punt return, go do that. But you, you can be fancy and look pretty, like you said earlier, right? Yeah, you can go do that. But you, you shouldn't be on the field if you don't want to go out there and strike and hit people and, and play nasty. That, that, to me, there's no way you should be on the field if you are afraid to tackle, Um, if you're afraid to strike somebody in the mouth. If you don't want to do that, you don't need to play. All right. So I think that qualifies as officially yelling at a cloud. So um, I think that puts us where we need to be. Uh, good job, Trey, again this week. Alan, that brings us to Alan's oxymoronic stats of the week. All right. So I think I got some good ones today. So as we mentioned, Ollie Gordon is the number one uh, rusher in the country, has the most rushing yards in the country. But Oklahoma State as a team uh, is only ranked seventh in the conference in total rushing yards. And a big reason for that is the gap between Ollie Gordon and Oklahoma State's next leading rusher, the gap is 1,069 yards. Um, so that leads the nation as the biggest gap between any two running backs or any two rushers on the same team. Uh, OSU's second leading rusher has just over 100 yards. So that's a pretty crazy gap, um, even though, I mean, it makes sense because he's very, very good, but that's, you know, he's 1,000 69 more rushing yards than the next highest person. That's a, work, on. That's a workhorse. Yeah, exactly. Um, Oklahoma State, they are the only top 25, current top 25 team that ranks in the bottom 25 in total defense. So out of the other 24 teams do, are ranked much higher than them defensively. They're one of two top 25 teams that rank in the bottom 25 in passing defense. And they're the only top 25 team that ranks in the bottom 25 in rushing defense. So interesting, their defense has been actually very bad, bottom 25 in all categories. So um, not really sure where they're getting it done. I guess maybe offense is, is really where they're doing it. Um, but even despite all that, they only give up 24 points a game. Um, so they are giving up a lot of yards, but they're not giving up a lot of scoring. Um, and then in Big 12 play this year, Ohio, uh, Oklahoma State has only had the lead entering the fourth quarter twice all season. So they've actually had four come from behind victories in the fourth quarter uh, in Big 12 play. So they are, um, you know, basically doing the opposite of what we do in the fourth quarter. And that's how they've been able to win five straight and uh, get into second place in the conference. And those are my stats of the week. Well, that's. uh certainly interesting and compelling so you know hey if we can um 
you know, play that ball control in the fourth quarter, we might have a shot at that. Um, we talked about how, uh, you know, Ollie was pretty much wearing down defenses in the fourth quarter. And, and that may be an opportunity for us if we can, if we can hold up. So thank you for that. Normally, uh, this would be the time for Josh's sometimes funny fact of the week, uh, which also includes song lyrics uh, <laughs> and uh, folks that we don't think we know, but we actually know uh, by the songs that they had. So uh, obviously we, we are missing him this week. We won't have that segment. So I'm just going to flash this up real briefly in honor of Josh. And then we're going to move on. So uh, we're now into the segment of listener love. So uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to the four new subscribers that we got over the last few days. Um, thank you guys for uh, taking the plunge and uh, actually subscribing to our content. One, uh, giving us the opportunity to give you more content that hopefully you enjoy. But two, it really helps us out a lot and, and makes it easier for you uh, to find our content as you browse YouTube. So, uh, thank you. Shout out to all of you. Um, and please continue to do that. In addition to that, um, we got lots of feedback last week. I, I think I may need to miss more shows because we got lots of great <laughs> feedback, uh, last week about Trey and, um, you know, Trey's, uh, being real. And, you know, part of the reason I asked Trey to be part of this is not just because, he and I are friends outside of the program, um, but also, you know, the fact that he can provide a recent player uh, uh, perspective, especially when it comes to, you know, going from a winless team to an undefeated team in the span of three years. And uh, and the the listeners seem to appreciate that candor and that inside view, as we said earlier uh, you know, some of the observations that we are making collectively as a group and Trey, you specifically are coming through in um, Coach Melzon's press conferences. So we it sounds like we are are seeing the things that he's seeing. And as much as we are uh, Monday morning quarterbacking here and in this case, Tuesday evening quarterbacking, um, you know, it, it seems like we're hitting the nail on the head. So thank you all. For providing us with that feedback it helps inform us on how to make this a better show for you please keep interacting please comment keep commenting tell other people uh about the show and uh and thank you for for the positive feedback it it really does make a difference for us as we sit here for two hours every week uh to to give provide you all the great content that we're doing so with all of that being said uh, it's time to pick our poison for this week. So we're going to pick our poison uh, for our score predictions. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with Alan, if you can tell us what your poison is. And actually, before that, Alan, why don't you go over last week's results? I was going to say that, yeah. All right, so... I corrected my, myself, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, was, I, you know, I, I was out of the seat, out of the chair for a week, and you see what happens. I forget I forget how to do this. So go ahead, Alan. So Roger and I disagree on this, but if we're going by Roger's uh, logic here, it, it the margin of victory matters. So I think this week I had the closest margin. I had UCF 19, Cincy 16. Um, so I had a three-point margin, but they won wow, by two. Wow, 19, 16. That's an interesting yeah. Yeah, uh, Josh had 31 21, Trey had 34 28, and Roger had 68 to 3 Cincinnati winning. <laughs> Clearly, I had the best one all you did. week you because did. It, it completely turned it around. I told you guys I would never pick against UCF, and the one week that I did in absentia, uh, we won. So I, I don't know, maybe, get some credit. maybe get some there's credit. some reverse psychology going on here. I don't know, something. Uh, my yeah. poisons weren't poison last week. They were all positive things. Yeah, that, oh that's true. Because I, I went back and listened to the show, you know, obviously, you know, before I edited and posted it, it they were definitely positive. So uh, you didn't do that this week for us, Trey. So hopefully maybe you'll do it in this segment. All right, go <laughs> ahead, Alan. I'm sorry. No, yeah. So that that's our um, scores from last week. Uh, for this week, you know, I'm going to go positive too. We're all gone on a positive vibe here. Um, I'm not sure if I believe what I'm saying right now, but I'm 
going to stick with it. I'm going to go UCF 33, Oklahoma State 30. Um, so I'm going to go 33 to 30. Um, it's a three and a half point spread or three point spread for a reason. Um, and every UCF game for the most part outside of a couple, I've been really close one possession game. So I'll stick with that and think we can maybe eke out a win. Uh, the thing that has me a little more confidence, even maybe it doesn't matter, but it is the space game, which we didn't mention yet. Um, mm. it, it is the space game. And I think you yeah, those fresh, fun. those fresh Carolina blues. I need yeah. to get those jerseys, man. And I think UCF is undefeated in the space game so far. So hopefully we don't end that streak. Um, my, my poison, it would just be, you know, just basically kind of everything we talked about today where, you know, basically we only got the win because since he was really bad and we revert back to, I mean, not that we really broke all of our old habits this past week against Cincy, but if we just look just completely awful, come out flat and, um, you know, just really get wrecked by, by Oklahoma state and, um, you know, don't get any closer to getting that first true big 12 victory and just kind of everything that any kind of mojo or momentum that we gained from last week just kind of falls flat. And we, you know, go back to really the frustrating style of play that we've seen, you know, most of, of big 12 play would be my poison. All right. Trey Neal, pick your poison. And what is your uh, prediction for this week? Yeah, so my score prediction, um, I'm going to have the same spread as Allen. I think it'll be a three-point game. I'm always going to go with the guys. So I think it'll be 30 to 27 um, okay. that we win. So, Allen, we might have a tie as far as point spread. We'll see who gets closer as far as the score. Yeah. Um, but my poison is going to it's gonna be similar. Um, I, I think the worst thing that could happen is the season unraveled before us. Um, I think, you know, we're going to be at home space game you know we're always hyped for those see those new jerseys those guys are going to have energy just you know because it's always cool to put on some new jerseys some new gear um some vintage stuff that you know you were once a year but the worst thing would be you know we start out slow something bad happens and it's just downhill from there and then just everything unravels and the things that you know we saw since you the brothers in arms it was just a facade and guys are pissed off and we revert back to those same old habits. Um, I think that'd be the poison. Um, because again, I think you're, you're never going to win every game all the time, you know, uh, it no, it, it happened <laughs> once, one no, time. It happened twice. Well, when, when the regular game. season in 2018, oh, every single yeah, game. But, but, yeah, but it's from the beginning to the end. Oh, so you're disparaging the 2018. No, 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 I'm, I'm not because there's something about finishing the deal. Like that, that was our even our big thing in the Peach Bowl. Did was, we get another freeze? No, I'm no. here. Y'all hear me? I hear you. Yeah, I, I think that like that was our big thing in the Peach Bowl. Just with the whole thing with Frost, with the whole thing with those seniors, it was it was finishing the deal. You know, we've gotten so far. Why lose? Why sour the entire season um, on that one thing? Um, but, yeah, like, I, I, it's hard to go undefeated, especially now that we're in the Big 12. I don't expect us to win every game. But there is a way that we should brand ourselves in playing. There's a way that we, str we strive to play when we were playing. We always wanted to be fast. We wanted to be physical. And when we wanted to be exciting. You know, that's, that's what UCF's brand – I think it's what it's turned into. We are a fun team to watch. We're explosive and we're going to play. We're going to be that way on both sides of the ball. I, I think if we don't show that, that would be a poison to me. And I, I think that's the thing about it. We have to, those guys have to keep carrying the mantle that, you know, we set and the guys even before me set like that, that's, that's what I think a lot of the guys are irked about. Um, Just from the former guys I talked to, it's, they're not playing to the standard that we have set. And yes, there is a standard to the way you play UCF football. It's not wins. It's not how many championships you win. That is great. But there is a style that we play. There is a brand that we play that guys have came back and talked to me and say, even during Owen, the Owen 12 year, dudes came back and said, you guys are not living up to the standard. You need to pick it up because you're embarrassing not only yourself, but us too as alumni. That is the same thing that we feel. And I think that's going to be my poison is 
just guys aren't playing, you know, fast, physical, and, and exciting. Okay. All right. Uh, for me this week, uh, I won't have as much to say, although I will say this. Um, Alan, you missed an opportunity last week uh, because – when you were out, I think I said 98 to three. So, you know, your margins that you're <laughs> off is going to be less. So uh, even though you, you did best last game, I feel like uh, you've, you've missed that opportunity to help yourself out for the rest of the season. So uh, although we have another opportunity to put Josh in the doghouse since he, he missed this year. So he may be buying the Cheetos and the steak. There uh, we go. For the season. So 110 to one. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, so, you know, for me, uh, for my poison, I'm going to say this week is that Gus doesn't control the team enough. Uh, defensively, he's kind of let the team do its own thing. I think Addie Williams is a first time coach. He needs, uh, he needs a, a steady hand to help support him and help him make decisions. So, um, you know, telling, um, Addy to go ahead and make sure that he stacks the box and make sure that he's consistent with that defensive eff effort and make sure that he's hammering that um, the guys don't bite on the fake on the inside. Um, I think that they're a one-dimensional team. I think that shows um, in the stats that, that Alan shared earlier. They're going to run the ball. If they're going to run the ball – you can stack the box and get numbers. And if you get numbers, they're going to lose the game. So, you know, I, I don't know why anybody else hasn't uh, hasn't done that. And uh, I, I, I'll i say this. Hey, look, uh, you've heard this, uh, heard other teams say this against us. If, if you're not going to beat us through the air, we're going to stop you on the ground and make you beat us through the air. Let's do that to Oklahoma State. And if we don't do that, then it's going to be a long game at the bounce house. So um, that's that's my poison for the week. As far as my predictions are concerned, unlike Alan, my actual prediction will be that we win uh, this game. Uh, I think our game. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. I think this is going to go into the fourth quarter. Um, and I think it's going to be a, a close game as it has all season. I think the difference is, uh, and my key to this game is, um, that ability for John Rice to have enough, um, <coughs> bless bless you. Thank you. confidence, uh, in his ability to make the difference in the, that plays down the stretch in the fourth quarter, because I do think it'll be a one possession game for most of the game. And if it is a one possession game for most of the game, uh, then it's going to come down to us making two or three, well, one or two plays uh, to make a difference in an individual possession. I think John Rice has got his groove back. Um, so uh, because of that, I'm going to say 32 to 28 UCF. Nice. Let's go. All right. Uh, now that we've talked about OSU and uh, our poisons and our keys to the game and, and Trey's yelled at people, uh, let's go ahead and talk about our Big 12 recap or super recap uh, by Alan this week. Yep. Alan. Another, um, another good week in the Big 12. Um, so started off uh, Thursday night with a uh, Thursday night football. We had Texas Tech. Uh, who we play later this year, they beat TCU 35 to 28. Um, obviously, we had our big win. Then Texas uh, nearly got upset, but escaped with an overtime win over Kansas State, which I guess the committee thought was a quality loss for Kansas State and kept them in the top 25. Then our our uh, our opponent this week, Oklahoma State, the final bedlam ever, uh, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma. Oklahoma State won a narrow one against DG and the Sooners, 27 to 24, um, part of the reason why they're ranked 15 now. Uh, then Houston um, did what we could not do, and they beat Baylor, uh, beat them in overtime in a one-point game. Houston uh, gets their second Big 12 win 
um, against Baylor there. Then Kansas beat Iowa State 28 to 21. And then West Virginia knocked the doors off of BYU 37 to 7. Um, so right now, as it stands, uh, Cincinnati is in sole possession of last place in the conference. Um, and then BYU and Houston both have two Big 12 wins. And then we have our one. And we have five teams in the Big 12 that are ranked in the most recent um, playoff uh, poll that just actually came out earlier tonight. Number seven, Texas, number 15, Oklahoma State, number 16, Kansas, number 17, Oklahoma, and number 25, Kansas State. So five teams in the playoff uh, poll right now. How does that compare to the ACC? As far as the ACC, I want to say it's better than the ACC. Uh, ACC obviously has number four, Florida State. They're in a playoff spot. Number 11, Louisville and number 24, UNC. So they have three ranked teams. All right. So the, the, Big 12, the Big 12 is better than the ACC this year. I know it yeah, is. And, that, so. and that's that's the point I was trying to make, right? But, and, and they have been for a long time. Um, you know, the thing that I think is lost on a lot of us is because we're in the Big 12 and because we have confidence in ourselves and, you know, who we should be. Um, got to remember, folks, we are in the third – uh, you know what? I'll say this differently. We are in the second best league in college football. And here's the reason why I say that. The Pack is doing good this year. They're doing really well this year, right? Um, better than what they normally do. Right. Um, the ACC has a couple of teams, usually Clemson and FSU, that are doing well. North Carolina's come on the last couple of years, but they've been crap since uh before that right yep. um the by the way last week's show got flagged by youtube just so you guys know uh so for for having uh adult words so my efforts to keep this show clean have oh. gone by the wayside in one week um <laughs> so uh you know I, as far as the big tens concerned you've got michigan and ohio state and nobody else uh, everybody else sucks. And then you've got the SEC. So who does that leave? The Big 12 with five ranked teams this year, right? And the SEC. So I don't know if you've watched Iowa football, but if you need people to... If you need to find um, a way to fall asleep at night, that's what you need to watch. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> like Iowa football. Oh, by the way, uh, so, uh, speaking of Big 10 football... Uh, you know, Matt Rule was it Matt Rule that took over at uh, Nebraska? Yeah, uh, he's doing a little better than old Frosty did. Just saying, yeah. just putting that out there. And that's not a shot at you, Trey. You only were there for one year, but um, yeah, they have a winning record right now. Yeah, they're making things happen. I'm bowl eligible. I'm pretty sure they'll be bowl eligible by year's end. Um, but again, Big Ten football. Other than Penn State, Ohio State, and Michigan, Michigan. that's Big Ten football. Michigan State plays every once in a while, you know, and and does fairly well. Everybody else sucks. Well, Wisconsin, I mean, they don't they don't ever make the playoff. I mean, they they make the championship game, but they fired their coach, the guy that got them there year after year after year after year after year. They fired their coach. So again. Even if you include <laughs> Michigan State, which has not been anything since D'Antonio left, Wisconsin, Penn State, um, Ohio State, and Michigan, I'd argue the Big 12's bottoms are, of that group is better than what the Big 10's is. And, and the Big 12, quite frankly, they beat each other up all the time. Right, they had the the long the the uh, they all played each other in years past, where that didn't happen in other other conferences. And on top of that, um, you know, it's any team in the Big Twelve that can be that team that next year. So to me, the Big Twelve is a better conference, is the second best conference. Another hot take, two hot takes in one week. The Big Twelve is the second best conference in the country. It has the second most amount of uh, ranked ranked teams right now. So, 
hundred percent. And I think with the guys that we, uh, we add, it'll. I think it's going to be very interesting next year. I think because a lot of those teams, the Pac-12 is done, so they kind of split up amongst everywhere. I think it'll be very interesting. Yeah, Utah's a great addition. I mean, yeah. They- I I think US, USC and Oregon uh, go to the Big Ten, right? So uh, is Utah and Washington too, right? Yeah, Washington, yeah, Washington. And Oregon. Yeah, they, so they, I, add some, they add better teams than we do as a whole, but yeah. So I, but think, I, I think Washington takes a step back next year because they're going to lose all their players to the draft. Washington hasn't been great. They have had a great a couple of great seasons since Michael Penix, who should be a UCF Knight. Um, and I'm, I know you're smirking at that, but there was a lot of fire and smoke around UCF with Michael Penix, yep. but we got out and I would for Washington. Uh, that's what happened, folks. We got out and I would right. Um, yep. could you imagine my, uh, cause he was the choice before JRP. So imagine Michael and Penix Bo too. and Bo Nix. Imagine them. Well, I don't, hmm. I don't know about Bo Nix because of the Gus ties. I think uh, Bo Nix wanted he to play. In a different... though, right? He did, but he wanted to play back in the SEC, right? And but Michael Penix, obviously, I think he was at what was he at Indiana. Indiana? So you know he would have come to UCF, but we got out and I yelled, and so at the end of the day, right? I would say that that power shift changes for the big 10 uh after all of those teams oregon um i I don't really i mean washington they're consistently decent but not the wild card is going to be usc it's going to be what which usc shows up so it's usc and oregon being added there versus yeah but ucla hasn't played well no i'm just saying like the teams they're adding as a whole yeah. No, I know, but I'm just saying the difference makers for them, the brands that they're bringing is Oregon and USC. Yeah. The Big I mean, 12 us, is bringing huh? Arizona, Arizona. A bit like if you compare the two, I mean, it's not like Arizona, Arizona State or that special. Or that's do anything that's where I was going with this. Yeah. So like we've got Utah coming in, which has perennially been good. Uh, oh. I don't necessarily like them too much, but they've perennially been good, right? And then uh, you've got Arizona, Arizona State, and Colorado. And Colorado hasn't been very good for a long time. Arizona and Arizona State have not. I mean, Arizona has been okay at times, but not has not been good for a long time. So that's where I said the pendulum yeah. may shift next year. But right yeah. now, I think that uh, that the Big 12 in its current composition is the second best conference in college football. All right. So now that we've talked about that ad nauseum and argued, uh, let's go ahead with the UCF athletics sports update. So Alan, do you want to take that or am I taking that in the absence of our, our very good friend, Josh? I'll, I'll take it in honor of Josh. All right. All right. So we already talked about UCF basketball starting off the season. Want to know um, as far as the other Olympic sports we have, Men's soccer, unfortunately, lost in the Sun Belt Conference uh, quarterfinals, uh, 3-2 to South Carolina. And now they await their fate from the NCAA tournament gods and the selection uh, committee will, or the selection day is on November 13th. So we'll see where they get seated and, you know, who they will face in that first round. But obviously they're a lock to make the tournament. Uh, then UCF women's soccer, they lost in the big 12 conference semis. So they did advance around, but ultimately lost to number seven BYU four to one. And unfortunately did not qualify for the tournament. Um, that was announced earlier this week. And then UCF women's volleyball, uh, lost back-to-back sets to Houston, dropping the first one three and and the second one three and one. And then they go on to take uh, to face off against BYU on Thursday. Yeah. So um, with UCF men's soccer, it's unfortunate because it's two straight losses in a row and they were number yeah. one. So I don't want this to turn into the number two of the South Florida directionally challenged uh, cows to our uh, West. Uh, well, to your, well, 
to none of our West because you're in South, you guys are in South Florida and I'm in North Florida, but to UCF's West, um, you know, so I don't want that to turn into that, but uh, you know, they should still be seated pretty well. Um, as far as women's soccer is concerned, uh, we had a conversation going about this and I said earlier on that the score differential was going to hurt us, but BYU is really, 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 really good and highly ranked. Um, and then for UCF women's volleyball, I know it's Houston, but Houston is actually very highly ranked uh, this year in volleyball as well. And BYU is perennially good. So it's going to be a tough matchup for um, UCF um, against BYU, but uh, make sure you're supporting the teams. One thing we didn't say um, that happened this season is that UCF track actually handed us our first Big 12 championship uh which is kind of crazy considering uh you know the the teams that we we have in the conference texas ou texas is usually has a very very good track team and i wanted to shout that out because it was our first big 12 championship and we didn't even mention it on the show and now we're mentioning it at the end of the show i should have mentioned that at the beginning of the show sorry uh that that was that was a a miss uh for me but i wanted to make sure we shouted them out and that, folks, with 205 left, takes us uh, to the end of the show without Josh. So we've talked a lot more uh, this, uh, this time around than normal. Um, and uh, that, that's it. So I know you guys can tell that I'm trying to stretch this out because I was trying to make 207 in honor of Josh. Um, but uh, that being said, thank you guys both uh, again uh, and Josh uh, for last week and spelling me while I, I had some work obligations. Um, it was great to see a win. Um, you know, I had to watch half of it after the fact, uh, but uh, it was good, good to see a win. And I'm looking forward, hopefully, uh, to another win this week against OSU. I, there's always a path, and I think there's a path. And... Um, you know, one of you two is going to have to mumble randomly at the end of this when we say go nights and charge on. So uh, that being said, remember to like, subscribe, follow, go nights and charge on. Keep going, baby. All right. Who's mumbling? Charge on. on. One, charge no, on. No, one of you two have to like mumble. Like, charge you on. know, like Josh does at the end of the show. And oh, you mean like, you know, oh, I think you're taking care of that right now. Yeah, I, I think.